Today, the Teamsters are here to say we are not beholden to anyone or any party. And I don't care about getting criticized. It's an honor to be the first Teamster in our 121-year history to address the Republican National Convention. When President Trump invited me to speak at this convention, there was political unrest on the left and on the right. Hard to believe. Anti-union groups demanded the President rescind his invitation. The left called me a traitor. And this is precisely why it's so important for me to be here today. If the extremes in both parties think I shouldn't be on this stage, you can have whatever opinion you want, but one thing is clear. President Trump is a candidate who is not afraid of hearing from new, loud, and often critical voices. And I think we all can agree, whether people like him or they don't like him, in light of what happened to him on Saturday, he has proven to be one tough SOB. You just watched a snippet of Teamsters President Sean O'Brien's speech at the RNC convention, and as you saw, he praised Donald Trump and drew a false equivalence between the far left and the far right, which is maddening to see because the so-called far left that he's attacking is the most pro-labor contingent in the country. Building union and worker power is central to the goal of the far left, but he just threw them under a bus all to cuck himself to a party that's hell-bent on destroying unions. So good job, Sean. Now, to be fair, I'm not opposed necessarily to a union president speaking at the RNC convention because I think that speaking truth to power is necessary. Trying to work with Republicans to build labor power, you know, that's fine. His job is to represent members of his union, not swear fealty to any one party. But what he says there matters. And if you're going to chastise Republicans for their attacks on unions and challenge them to do better, that's one thing. Now, he did that to a limited extent. The problem is that he gave fake populists like Josh Hawley and J.D. Vance cover and clout from unions that they did not earn. Here's what he says about that. But over the last 40 years, the Republican Party has really pursued strong relationships with organized labor. There are some in the party who stand in active opposition to labor unions. This, too, must change. In my administration, the Teamsters reached out to eight Republican senators who stood up for railroad Teamsters over our fight for paid sick leave. Josh Hawley was one of them. Senator Hawley changed his position on national right to work. Then we started walking. Senator Hawley walked a Teamsters picket line in St. Louis and a UAW picket line in Wentzville, Missouri. More than that, I want to recognize Senator Hawley for his direct relentless and pointed questioning of corporate talking heads, lawyers, CEOs, and apologists. The Teamsters and the GOP may not agree on many issues, but a growing group has shown the courage to sit down and consider points of view that aren't funded by big money think tanks. Senators like J.D. Vance, Roger Marshall, and representatives Nicole Maliotakis, Mike Lawler, and Brian Fitzpatrick are among elected officials who truly care about working people. So a lot of Republicans got shout outs, namely Josh Hawley. And what he said about Josh Hawley is true. He did vote to add an additional seven days of paid sick leave for Teamsters. He also announced that he's no longer in support of anti-union right to work laws, which would destroy unions. So that's great. On top of that, he did show up to the picket line. So O'Brien very clearly feels like Hawley is a Republican who's gettable, who he can work with. The problem is that it's all very clearly cynical on Hawley's part. And everyone can see that apparently, except for O'Brien. 
line. The Kansas City Star called his picket line pandering phony political theater, and they say this because of his long anti-labor record. He not only voted against a $15 an hour minimum wage, but when a vote came up for the Butch Lewis Act to protect the pensions of Teamsters members, can you guess how Josh Hawley voted? He voted with every other Republican to not protect their pensions from being cut. In other words, he effectively supported a cut to the pensions of members that Sean O'Brien represents. But as O'Brien pointed out, he no longer supports right to work laws. So great. The real question is, does he actually support expanding unions? Because that's the real test. And the answer is an obvious no. As Jeff Stein of the Washington Post points out, at the RNC, Teamsters President Sean O'Brien is characterizing both parties as ambivalent about unions with room to improve. There are 48 Senate sponsors of the PRO Act. They all caucus with the Democratic Party. Zero are Republicans. And that, of course, includes Josh Hawley. Josh Hawley is a fraud. Everyone in the country can see it, except... For Sean O'Brien. Now, it gets even worse because O'Brien tweeted out an article written by Josh Hawley titled The Promise of Pro-Labor Conservatism, which is an oxymoron, by the way. And he said that Josh Hawley was 100% on point. But in the article that he shares, Hawley not only praises Reagan and, and his, his record on labor, but he also spreads the exact kind of divisive rhetoric that pits working class people against each other, writing, quote, the C-suite long ago sold out the United States, shuttering factories in the homeland and gutting American jobs while using the profits to push diversity, equity, and inclusion, and the religion of the trans flag. Once upon a time, the head of General Motors could say with an entirely straight face, what's good for GM is good for America. These days are are long over. Now, he goes on to say that it's bad that Republicans oppose unions and says that O'Brien's speech resonated with some people at the RNC. But that paragraph right there demonstrates exactly why he's not serious about building real worker power. He's trying to get workers to think that DEI, i.e. people of color, and trans people are the real enemy. When those marginalized people are workers as well. They're in the same class as workers that unions represent. And the reason why Republicans try to get working class people to fight each other is because that serves the interests of the economic elites. If workers are fighting each other, then guess what? They're not looking up at the abuse coming from the top. They're not looking at the elites. It's the oldest trick in the book, but Sean O'Brien just endorsed this anti-worker tactic and said that Josh Hawley was 100% on point. Sean O'Brien just full-throatedly endorsed rhetoric that hurts black and brown workers and LGBTQ plus workers. And aside from the bigotry, I'm sorry, it's just fucking stupid. The fact that a union president would endorse that article is dumb. Hawley is saying that trans people and people of color are the real reason why corporations are shutting factories and hurting regular workers because they're spending their profits on DEI and trans religion, whatever the fuck that means. No, they're spending profits on stock buybacks. They're spending the money that they make to lobby politicians like Josh Hawley to deregulate. They're spending those profits on salaries for CEOs so they can buy mansions and yachts. They're not spending their money on DEI and big trans, you fucking moron. But O'Brien is saying that Holly is 100% on point. Amazing. But when it comes to Trump, we've had four years to see where he stands. He was explicitly anti-labor and anti-union as president, and that has not changed. He still supports right-to-work laws. And as a matter of fact, Project 2025 would reverse positive changes made by Biden's NLRB. And they would also undo child labor laws. That's something that they're also pushing for. Now, if I'm not mistaken, one of the other goals of Project 2025 is to enact nationwide right-to-work laws, which would destroy unions. So it doesn't make sense for a union president to get in bed with a party that wants to destroy the organization he's the president of. But to be fair to him, O'Brien isn't explicitly endorsing Trump. And as Reuters reports, since he's not making a specific endorsement of either candidate, this is largely seen as a blow to Biden, given his record on unions compared to Donald Trump's. Now, when it comes to Biden's record, O'Brien has acknowledged that that record is very good, comparatively speaking. In fact, he acknowledged this at the RNC convention. And Joe Biden, as you all know, has a decades uh, long record of being one of the most pro-union politicians in America. The first president to walk a picket line with striking workers. Um, you were there when he announced a $36 billion rescue plan for pensions for 350,000 Teamsters. Um, and yet, you are the first major union to, or the last ma major union to endorse, and you haven't endorsed him. 
Why is he not automatically your pick? Well, because, look, I mean, um, he is definitely the most pro-labor president we've ever had and we've ever seen. And you're correct. He did fund, he did fix pensions nationwide, not just the Teamsters, with $100 billion. Uh, so he has done a lot of work on behalf of, of the Teamsters Union, and, and we're very proud of the work that he did. He just said that Biden is the most pro-labor president we've ever had and ever seen. Yet, he was at the RNC convention cucking himself to Donald Trump and the Republicans who spent decades trying to destroy unions like the one that he represents. Make it make sense. It is completely nonsensical. Now, to be absolutely fair to him, Biden is in no way perfect when it comes to labor. He did shut down a railroad worker strike, which was horrible. He also, I would argue, didn't use his leverage to fight hard enough to pass the PRO Act and a $15 an hour minimum wage. So I think it's important to be fair and point those things out. Having said that, though, Biden's NLRB alone is enough to say that he is leagues ahead of Donald Trump and best for Teamsters based on that putting aside whether or not he can win, of course. But that right there, the NLRB alone, single-handedly makes Biden leagues better than Donald Trump. Now, I don't know what kind of game O'Brien is playing here. Maybe he's playing 4D chess and he's trying to extract additional concessions out of Biden and that's why he's withholding his endorsement. I think that's a perfectly valid strategy if that's the case. The problem is we don't really know if that's what he's doing. And on top of that, his RNC speech gave voters the impression that Republicans are somehow preferable to Biden and Democrats when that's just factually incorrect. His speech was an implicit endorsement of Donald Trump, and now Sean O'Brien has helped to foster this false narrative that Republicans are suddenly becoming pro-labor when that's just not the case. This is the labor equivalent of gays for Trump. It's self-sabotage, and what he's doing doesn't make sense. Now, the Valley Labor Report, which is the best source for news when it comes to unions and labor, they tweeted out an article from Capital and Maine, this one right here, that features an interview from Teamsters member Rick Smith that makes it very clear that O'Brien does not speak for all Teamsters. Teamsters. But to give you some context, quote, Rick Smith is a longtime Teamster who says O'Brien is normalizing Trump by granting him a platform to appeal to union members, especially given Trump's poor labor record. Smith is a truck driver and host of The Rick Smith Show, a nationally syndicated talk show about workers and labor power. Smith spoke out against O'Brien's turn toward Trump on his show. He was later confronted at a party by O'Brien, who demanded he make an on-air apology for his remarks, an encounter that was first reported by The New York Times. Now, when it comes to O'Brien's decision to cozy up to Trump, Smith viewed that as a tacit endorsement and called it leadership malpractice. And he goes on to explain the stark differences between Biden and Trump's NLRB appointments. I mean, Trump literally appointed Peter Robb to the NLRB general counsel who fired air traffic control workers in 1981. It's just horrible. Now, he also says that Trump's pandering to unions and workers is phony, arguing it's all a show and no substance. We went through an entire four years of Donald Trump promising to reshore manufacturing and invest in infrastructure. He did nothing but talk. Look at what his administration did. Donald Trump appointed Neil Gorsuch to the Supreme Court, a guy who was the deciding vote in the Janus decision, basically creating a right-to-work environment in the public sector. Donald Trump himself says he supports right-to-work laws. Exactly. Now, other rank-and-file members of the Teamsters have spoken out via social media and made it very clear that they do not agree with O'Brien here. But with that being said, it's not unreasonable to assume that a lot of union members are pro-Trump, not necessarily because they agree with his labor practices and policies, but because they agree with him on other issues that they feel are more salient than labor, like immigration or social issues. And that actually does kind of seem to be O'Brien's MO here, right? There's no way he's okay with Trump's position on labor. I feel like that would be insane. But perhaps, you know, Trump is personally enticing to him because of other issues, social issues in particular. And I say this because, as The Guardian reports, the Teamsters had to pay $2.9 million to settle a racial discrimination lawsuit after the organization made mass terminations of mostly non-white staffers. Specifically, 72.73% of the total staffers who were fired were people of color, whereas only 28.57% were white. And since most staffers overall are white, they don't think it's a coincidence that mostly black and brown people at an organization that is overwhelmingly white happen to get the ax. Furthermore, 13 black and Hispanic staffers accused O'Brien of publicly humiliating them after he claimed they were fired because they were quote, bad apples, and they were lazy, according to him. Now, we really don't know more than that, but in light of this story, it does make a little bit more sense as to why Josh Hawley's specific brand of class politics that exclusively appeals to white workers might resonate with someone like O'Brien. Although, 
I don't know. This is all supposition. I can't get inside his brain. You know, it's possible that O'Brien actually thinks there is something to be gained by trying to get Republicans to be more receptive to unions. And if that were the case, then, you know, that would be great. Although to me, it seems like they kind of just see him as a useful idiot to dupe workers into voting against their own self-interest. But even if that's true, I will admit that there were parts of O'Brien's speech that were actually really good. And, you know, if he's able to plant the seed of class consciousness in some Republicans and get them to just think about these issues differently, you could argue that that's a benefit. So I'll show you a small clip of uh, him basically saying good stuff, because I don't want to be overly cynical and negative, but here's the parts that I think were really great. Against gigantic multinational corporation, an individual worker has zero power. It's only when Americans band together in democratic unions that we win real improvements on wages, benefits, and working conditions. Remember, elites have no party, elites have no nation. Their loyalty is to the balance sheet and the stock price at the expense of the American worker. We need corporate welfare reform. Under our current system, massive companies like Amazon, Uber, Lyft, and Walmart take zero responsibilities for the workers they employ. These companies offer no real health insurance, no retirement benefits, no pay leave, relying on underfunded public assistance. And who foots the bill? The individual taxpayer. The biggest recipients of welfare in this country are corporations, and this is real corruption. That was great. All incredible points. And you can argue that maybe he made this speech because he thought there was the possibility of moving some Republicans, or at a minimum, Republican voters. But again, the message that he's espousing here is undercut by his embrace of divisive white identity politics of the right. And that's what he did. And he's kind of speaking out of both sides of his mouth here because in his speech, he says that corporations care about their bottom line only, and that's true. But then after he made that speech, he shared Josh Hawley's article where he claims that the suits are actually ideologues who misuse corporate profits to promote DEI and the trans religion. So, I mean, you have to pick a lane, right? Because what O'Brien is doing here is seemingly nonsensical. I get that he thinks there's something to gain by doing this, but it doesn't really seem like that's the case, right? If labor is going to win, it has to be unified. This has to be a rainbow coalition where everyone in the same class views each other as equals, not as enemies. And everything the Republican Party stands for is antithetical to that goal. They want us divided and they want us fighting each other. They want workers to hate trans people and immigrants and black and brown people. And they want them to view each other as the real enemies and not the bosses, not the CEOs, not the elites. That's the goal of the Republican movement. It's class division. So I don't know what O'Brien's motives are here. Nobody really does. Maybe his intentions are pure. That's entirely possible. Maybe it's a cynical ploy by him to be labor secretary under Donald Trump. Who knows? One thing that I know for sure, though, is that this move right here helps Republicans far more than any one of the Teamsters that he represents. Thank mm -hmm. you.